So we're going to conclude today uh, verses 11 through 21 in 1 John chapter 5. And as I went through it and I meditated on it and translated the scriptures uh, into English, what I got out of it was checking your idolatry at the door. Checking your idolatry at the door. We all have idols in our lives. I spoke very heavily about this last Yom Teruah, um, about the fact that we are a temple and that we carry idols within our temples and that we must be very advocative in the sense that we need to look within ourselves to see what kind of flaws and what kind of idols I have set up in my temple and what I need to do to get rid of them. And by the time I'm done with this message today, I hope you'll understand just how serious these idols really are because at the end of the day, these idols will prevent you from attaining eternal life. And this is very important. We cannot have a lackadaisical attitude towards these idols in our lives because ultimately it will prevent us from having eternal life. It's a dead serious um, it's a dead serious message that John is talking about in here. And so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this and uh, let's see if we, what we can glean from it. So picking up in verse 11 it says, And this is the testimony, uh, the testimony as judicial evidence. This is the testimony which is as judicial evidence that Yahweh has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Sounds very elementary, but he actually classifies it as judicial evidence. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of Yahweh does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of Yahweh that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name that has authority and character of the Son of Yahweh. Verse 14, now this is the confidence of blunt speech that we have in him. That if we ask through craving or requirement of anything, according to his will, which is a determined decree, he hears us. He hears us. And verse 15, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask through craving or requirement, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. See, today we have an example of this. I didn't know what was going to happen, but Carmen had a craving inside of herself, and she felt a requirement to come up and pray for my foot. And everybody joined in. So there you go. There's a demonstration of what this scripture is talking about. And she was admitted she was a little apprehensive about whether she should do it or not, but she did the right thing. She did the right thing. And that comes from listening to the Ruach enough that you begin to really hear its voice and what it's trying to tell you to do. The problem for us as human beings is that our flesh gets in the way and it's like, but what if? What if? What if? You know, and when we start telling ourselves what if, that's when the fear and the doubt comes in. And so we can't really demonstrate who we are and have this life flowing out of us if we keep that life inside of us. And so eventually if that life stays inside of us and it doesn't flow outside of us like rivers of living waters, then we cannot benefit anybody else. So uh, even now I'm feeling that I'm not feeling pain in the foot at the moment. So Baruch Hashem, I just, just noticed I'm not feeling pain there. I was feeling that, before I was feeling this, like somebody's grabbing both ends of your tendon and they're stretching it like a rubber band. And I'm not, I'm not feeling anything now. Okay, so let's move on. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother sinning as to miss the mark and not share in the prize, and that's important because our prize is eternal life. That's what we're all in this for. Okay, and so sharing in that prize is when you see another brother or another sister who's doing something that's not right, we have a responsibility to come and intercede on behalf of that person. And because if we don't, then they're on their way out of sharing in this prize. And that should really be a great concern for us. And it's concerned for me because I see a lot of people going through stuff in their life that causes them problems where they are on their way out. 
and it's a very, very dangerous place to be. And oftentimes those people are in so much in, into the flesh that they can't even fear any, feel anything spiritual. And it's for us to come with force. I don't mean force in the sense of violence in the flesh, but force in the spirit to shake a person up back into reality, you know? And uh, that's not always an easy thing to do, but it's something that we need to do because you never know. One day we may find ourselves in that situation and then we wonder why does nobody come to our aid and help us with this idol that we got on ourselves that I chose not to check out at the door. When we come into the house of Yahweh, we need to check those idols in at the door and leave them outside. And when we come into the Sabbath, those idols don't belong here on this Sabbath. They don't belong in our lives, period. But especially when it comes to the Sabbath. Because then, if we bring those idols in here, then we don't have rest. The rest of us don't have rest. And sometimes I'm grieved in my spirit because I can feel these idols saying, I'm here, what the hell are you going to do about it? You know? And it bothers me. It really bothers me. You know? Because we're told that we're not supposed to bring any burdens in on the Sabbath. And yet, you know, if you're going to be burdened, then, okay, stay home maybe. Pray, but don't come in and let it be infectious to everybody else. And so when we lose that kind of sensitivity, where we really just don't care how we're affecting everybody else, it's a very, very dangerous place to be. But anyway, let's move on. To, as to miss the mark and not share in the prize, a sin which does not lead to death. He will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray as an interrogating request about that. Okay? So this, is, this was not his focus, because apparently this is not really... What he's talking about, whatever he was talking about, he's not talking about praying about that because it's not that far. We're not talking about that kind of an issue right now. So let's not focus on that. So apparently this may have been a sin that's not leading to death, but it is a sin and it causes problems. And there are some kinds of idolatrous worship that we all indulge in that probably is not going to lead to death. But we need to pray about that because we need to try to do everything we can to eradicate that and keep it outside the door. Check it in at the door. Don't let it come inside, whether it's in your house or on the Sabbath or somebody else's house. So we need to check these, these son of a guns in at the door and not let them in. All unrighteousness, which is legal injustice, is sin. And there is a sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born and procreated of Yahweh does not sin as to miss the mark and not share in the prize. But he who has been born of Yahweh keeps as to guard oneself from loss or injury of himself. And the wicked one who has degenerated himself from original virtue does not touch or attach to him. And I think that's important because the word touch really doesn't convey to me strongly enough what it's really talking about in the Greek. In other words, he can't attach himself to you. You know, you can touch a person, but if you're like grab them and you hold on to them where you're controlling them, that's a whole different feeling altogether. And so what he's saying is that a person in this situation, the devil will not be able to attach himself legally to that person to where he dominates and controls that person and establishes these idols in a person's life. And so we got to do everything we can to make sure that we are walking with Yeshua in such a way that we do have this eternal life inherent within us at all times to the point that the devil cannot attach himself. He's always trying. I, I feel it on myself. I'm constantly feeling how legally he's trying to come in and get me to do this and get me to do that. And I even had that battle this morning. I had to go upstairs and pray for a little bit because I could feel the enemy coming at me. Just do this. Just do this. Just do it. Get it out of your system. Just do this. And I had to pray to Yahweh. I don't want to give in to this. And I can't legally come up here and speak if I give in to my flesh. And so I had to go up and I had to rebuke this thing because I'm feeling this pressure. It's just like pressing down on me constantly. 
And I'm like, no, I can't do it. As much as my flesh is saying, do it, bro. Just do it, man. You'll feel so much better when you're done. I can't do it. I can't do it. And it's not easy. It's not easy because sometimes when, the, when these idols speak to us, they speak to us in a way that it almost sounds like Yahweh. Because it feels so doggone good if you were to entertain it. And surely if it feels good, it's got to be right. You know, there's an old saying, if it feels good, do it. You know, that's kind of my motto. But I don't have that luxury. <laughs> Standing up here, I don't have that kind of luxury. So I have to tell that idol, get the hell away from me. Leave me alone. I'm not going to give in. Even though it kind of makes some sense to give in from an intellectual perspective and from an emotional perspective and even from a biblical legal one, it actually sounds kind of good. But man, if you don't check that idol in at the door, you're going to give in. And boy, is there going to be trouble in hell for me to pay. I will pay. I paid so much for stuff like that that I'm tired of paying that kind of a price. So we've got to be careful not to allow the enemy to attach himself to us where he now is regulating us and moving us all around like we're a puppet. And he's the puppet master. And whatever he tells you to do, that's what you're doing because you're a slave to unrighteousness. Well, the eternal life can't stay inside of us if we're going to function that way. Let's move on. We know that we are having the hope of Yahweh. Interesting, we are means having the hope. You wouldn't get that by reading it just on the surface, which is why I put these in here like this, because it makes more sense. Of Yahweh and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one that spreads disease and malice. Malice. Remember, we're coming up to the spring feast now and the Passover, and Yeshua talks about that we don't keep the, the, the feast with unleavened bread of malice, or with the spirit of malice. And the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees is the, is the bread of malice. We cannot have malice. And, and I say it every year and I'll say it again. Man, if there's anything going on inside your life that ain't kosher and you got malice going on, do not take of the days of unleavened bread and the Passover. Don't do it. Don't do it. It was so bad for me one time many years ago. I was so down and out and I was so into the flesh. I didn't take on the Passover. I waited a whole nother year because I would not get my act together. I didn't want to repent. But I had enough sense and enough fear that I was not going to take of that Passover because I knew if I did, I was going to get a severe can whooping by Yahweh. I knew that much. I had enough experience to know that. But I still was in my pity party and I didn't want to change. So I didn't take the Passover day. I skipped it. Because I knew if I took of that bread and wine, I was going to eat and drink judgment onto myself. And man, I had enough problems going on. I don't need Yahweh breathing down my rear end. So, you know, word to the wise is sufficient. Really check your idols in at the door. And if you're not willing to do that, at least have enough common sense saying, brothers and sisters, I'd love to be with you, but it ain't going to be the smart thing for me. Maybe in the second month, I'll take it if I can get my rear end straightened out. But right now, I'm not in the right state of mind. I'm not taking the Passover. So if we don't check our idols in at the front door, don't take the Passover. We got to get these idols under control. Okay, so let's move on. Verse 20. And we know that the Son of Yahweh has come and has given us an understanding of deep thought. Of deep thought. That is what the understanding means. That we may know with perception him who is true and we are in a state of rest. That word in means a state of rest. Are you, can, you, can you rationally say to yourself with pure honesty, I am in a state of rest. In the sense that you're secure with the internal life that is abiding inside of you. Can you truly say that? And if you can't say that, it's an indication that there are idols that have got through that front door. And you better really sit down and start examining and you better start pointing them out and you got to start calling them out. Because if you don't get real with yourself... You can't be real with anybody else. And if you're not real with anybody else and yourself, you can't be real with the Messiah. 
So it's important to be able to check these idols in at the front door and kick them out, destroy them, burn them, whatever it takes. Find a way to get leverage with yourself where you say, this just isn't worth it anymore. I don't want to lose my eternal life because I refuse to get rid of these idols in my life. So let, let's be vigilant to be able to do that. That means you need to go somewhere and sit quiet. Turn off your phone. You've checked out of this world and you're going to sit quiet and you're going to meditate. Chances are, if you look at where problems are in your life, you can link that problem to a particular idol that you have in your life. And when you can link those two, then you can say, I got it. I got where this came from. I see where it first got rooted in my life. And then that's when you have to stop and say, if the way it came in, I got to boot it out. But only you can do that because even Yahweh is not going to do it for you. You have to make a conscious decision on your own that you are going to weed this thing out of your life because you're sick and tired of making you sick and tired. And until you hit rock bottom, nothing's going to change. That's the way it is for me. And I'm sure I'm no different than you guys. And a lot of times I keep getting whooped and getting whooped and I know what I got to do, but I'm just too stupid and stubborn to make the change. But everybody sooner or later is going to get whooped to the point where they say, I'm tired, I'm wore out, I can't deal with it anymore. And that's when it's time to check that idol out at the front door. And once you do that, then you're liberated, you're set free, and you're not held captivity anymore by those emotions or those behaviors, whatever the case may be. Let's move on. In a state of rest of him who is true in his son, Yeshua, Hamashi, uh, Messiah, this is the true Yahweh and eternal life. So there we go. This is the true Yahweh and eternal life. See, this is what we're fighting for. We're fighting to keep this eternal life in us. And the enemy is throwing everything at us. He's throwing the kitchen sink. He's throwing the toilet, unflushed toilets. He's throwing at you and it's splattering all over the place. It's a dirty world. It's a dirty mess. It's a bad fight. It's a street fight we're in. It's a brawl. It's a serious brawl. I don't know about you, but I get tired. I, I mean, the, the, the devil, he don't stop. He keeps coming, man. He trash talks me all day long. The only time I don't get trash talk is when I lay my head at night to sleep. But as soon as I'm out of that bed in the morning, man, he right at me. He right at me. He don't give me no rest. And he's always going to come at you through other people. He's going to use other people to come at you. And they're going to complicate your life. Don't make that other person your idol. Because that's the intended purpose. Is it not? When another person can dominate your life and influence you in negative ways, do they not become an idol at that moment? Do not give your power away to another person. Let's move on. Verse 21. Little children, keep as to be on guard of yourselves from idols. See, he sums it up now. We need to be on guard about these idols. Because they're coming at us. Some of them are just blatant and, 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 and easy to understand from the surface. But man, some of them just sneak in under the radar. And you don't even know it got rooted inside of you until maybe even a couple years later when all of a sudden it's like everything starts blowing up in your life. You're like, how did this happen? How did this happen? And then all of a sudden it comes back to where this thing got rooted a few years ago and you make the connection. And then you say to myself, I didn't think that was such a big deal when I indulged in this at that time. I really didn't think it was such a big deal. And I let it in. And man, it took root and that was the end of it. And so it's kind of like weeds, you know, you allow weeds to come in your garden and they get in there and you may not see them for a while, but all of a sudden, months later, it's not something that happens right away, all of a sudden they spread all over the place and they take over everything. Cancer's like that. You know, once cells start to mutate, and then once they metastasize, Sandra knows, Michelle knows, you guys are doctors. You know, once it metastasizes, you're in big trouble. It's all over at that point, unless you always steps in. Okay, uh, on guard of yourselves from idols of heathen Elohim worship. 
heathen Elohim worship. I'm not going to go into, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's self-explanatory. But the heathens have their form of worship. And it's constantly trying to sneak in here all the time. All the time it sneaks in here. This is part of the problem. What happens when new people come into the fellowship or coming out of the church or those environments, they bring these idols in here. I hear it. I see it. I feel it. I taste it. I touch it. And I have to tell myself, patience, long-suffering, mercy, compassion. The person doesn't understand that they're in violation and they've come through a sacred door, a threshold over here, which is the Sabbath, and we don't do those things over here, which is why this is supposed to be an Acts 15 compliant fellowship. This is not an open door fellowship where you just come from anywhere and with whatever ideologies you got and then a little leaven leavens the whole lump. But you know what I got to say? It's not easy for me. It's not easy because I see these idols coming in all the time. I listen to what people say. I watch what they do and I'm like, oh, oi vey, oi vey. Yahweh, give me the strength because I just want to come and just snap the neck. And wake them up and say, do you not understand what you're doing? But the thing is, is that mercy is the weightier matter of Torah. You know, it's easy to just snap somebody's neck and get it over with. But that's not the way. That's not the way. As much as I love to do that because it's quick, it's painless, and it's over. You know, but that's not the way to do it. That's not the way to do it. And so... Despite the fact that people come in and they do things that they shouldn't really be doing and they don't understand, I understand they don't know what they're doing, if they're meant to stay, Yahweh impresses upon them to stay. And over time, I've seen where people have changed their dialogue. But I know one thing, if the dialogue don't change, you're going to be right out with the idol you got. And the door's going to slam you right on the rear end on the way out. You, Yahweh will find some way to get you out of here. Because you have a certain amount of time where he'll allow you to get away with it. But then there'll come a point where if you're just stubborn hard and you're not going to change, you're gone. And they're gone. And you know what? As soon as they're out the door, Yahweh brings other people. And I'm not saying that this is a special fellowship. I'm not saying it's better than any other place. That's not my point. I'm talking about principle. That's what I'm talking about. A lot of us are sick and tired of being from the church. We don't want the church anymore. We know that doesn't work, and we've come here because we're sick and tired of that stuff. We've already been down that road. We already know where it leads. We're not interested, and thank you very much. So that's why we're here. But then that spirit wants to come bring it over here, and it wants to infect this. But it doesn't work. At least not in the years that I've been doing this. It doesn't work eventually they get booted out some kind of way. So we need to be gar on guard and make sure that we keep those idols checked in at the door up front. So checking your idolatry at the door. It's interesting because what I did was I looked at this concept of eternal life and I searched all of the gospels and, and the epistles for the term eternal life and surprisingly there's really not that many. The phrase eternal life. Because this is what John's talking about, is abiding in this eternal life. And stay away from these idols, which will prevent you from attaining, attaining this eternal life. And so, when I looked at it, I began to break it down and I said, this is interesting. Because what I'm seeing is 12 basic points. There are others, but I'm broken down into 12 basic points of how you can kick these idols out to the front door and how you will maintain your eternal life and stay in abiding in the Messiah Yeshua. So let's, let's go ahead and lose, let's move forward. So starting off first, in Exodus chapter 20, in verse 3, it says, You shall have and allow to exist no other strange Elohim before, which means above, over, or against me. There you go. So John's saying we need to be careful about these idols that will take away our eternal life. And Yahweh is saying they should not be above, 
over or against me. No strange idols. Anything that's foreign to what I have already spoken through my word and through my Messiah to you is a strange idol. And you need to discard it at all costs. So we cannot have anything before Yahweh. We must eradicate these strongholds that we all have in our lives. So, first off, the concept of this is lose your life. If you want to get rid of this idols, you're going to have to lose your life. And what does that mean? Well, in John chapter 12, verses 24 through 26, it says here, Most assuredly, amen, amen. I say in a systematic way to you, unless grain of wheat falls to the ground. Are you wheat? Are you not wheat? Yes. Unless you fall to the ground and you die, it remains in a state of expectancy alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves as an object of affection his life will lose by fully destroying it. And he who hates as to love less his life in this world will keep with preservation as a reward um, of it for eternal life. So we cannot love our lives the way we did when we were out in the world before we came to Yeshua. You know, yes, you can still enjoy things of this world, but you got to be able to keep it in its proper perspective. But if you're sitting down and you're watching um, TV all day, I was telling uh, Chris back in the, the mid-80s when I, when I was trying to come out of my depression uh, and all that kind of stuff, my wife will tell you, I used to sit there for 10, 12 hours a day with Cokes, Coca-Colas, not Coke, Coca-Cola, pretzels, you know, Snicker bars, you know, all that stuff that's somewhere over in here. I don't know. But um, all those things. And I used to sit there and watch MTV all day long. One music I video after another. MTV. Yeah, all day long. Whether I liked the video I was seeing at the moment or not, it didn't matter. It was escapism for me. I was able to escape from the pain that I was in. Of course, it was still waiting for me with penalties and interest when I came out of that world and had to face it again. And then that just drove me into more depression. I go watch more videos and drink more Coke and more Snicker bars and all that kind of stuff. So the thing is, is that we have to not um, love the world the way we did before. We can still enjoy some things, but we got to keep it in perspective. We really got to be able to keep it in perspective. And I find now, really for me, since I'm doing ministry, I, my time is so consumed with so much stuff that I got to do with this, um, because it is a part-time thing, because I have a full-time business. Um, it consumes so much of my time that really the passions and desires I had for things that I used to do out in the world, I really, I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, it might be nice now and then to do this, but... I don't have the time and I really don't have the passion that I used to have to do that anyway. It's like, to me, this is more important. So what you focus on is what they say is, what you focus on is what you're going to get. So if you're going to focus on the things of this world, that's what you're going to get. That's what's going to crowd your life. So let's move on. Verse 26. If anyone serves as a waiter who serves tables for me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant who acts as a deacon or deaconess will, also, will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father, father will honor. Okay. Second concept. Enable to maintain your eternal salvation and stay connected to Yeshua is keeping the commandments. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 28, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer who was an expert of Mosaic law stood up and tested thoroughly him, saying in a systematic discourse, Teacher, what shall I do or perform to inherit eternal life? He said in verse 26 to him, What is written in the law? of Moses. What the way is your reading of it? Or in other words, which way do you read it? In other words, when you read it, what do you get out of it when you read it? That's what he's saying. Verse 27. So he answered and said, you shall love in a social and moral sense Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, thoughts, and feelings, with all your soul, which is your breath, whatever comes out of your mouth, with all your strength, which is your forcefulness, and with all your mind, which are your deep thoughts, and your neighbor as yourself. 
verse 28. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, that is morally correct. That word rightly means morally correct. Do perform this and you will live. So what he's talking about here is when he says love Yahweh with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, traditionally that just, to people that simply just basically means with all of your being. But the fact of the matter is he says the second commandment is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you know, loving your neighbor as yourself requires you to use those last six commandments, does it not? But in order to love Yahweh, what does Yahweh expect you to do? No idols. Right? No idols. Don't make any idols. Don't take my name in vain, which is what, what most of the world does. And don't defile the Sabbath. So you can say all day long, and I've used the illustration before, I can say to my wife, honey, I love you. Oh my gosh, I love you with all my heart, soul, strength, every part of my being. You're the most incredible female. But I still got to see these other women on the side. Now, what does that tell you? tells you I'm a hypocrite. I really don't love her in the true sense. So, you know, I use the church as an example. They say they love the Messiah and they love Yahweh. Do they really? Because Yeshua says the first and great commandment is not violating those first four. But that church says, no, we don't need that stuff. So can you theoretically really love your neighbor correctly if you won't first honor Yahweh with the first four commandments? I don't think so. Can you love at some degree? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And you will find that in the church to a certain degree. But like I said before, you give me five minutes, I can go into any church and I'll turn that whole place upside down real quick. And then we're going to see what kind of love you really got going on in that joint. And I'm going to tell you, that love going to get tested when I come at that thing. And I've done it. I know what I'm talking about. It don't take much to overturn it, you know. Because the thing is, when everybody's in agreement about being disagreeable in these concepts, it's easy to turn it upside down. I know how to do it. <laughs> okay. So, but my point is, is that if you really want to love your neighbor, in the true sense of the love, as I've gone through these epistles, how John is describing it, you really have to get the love from Yahweh first. But if you refuse to love him in the way that he says he expects you to love him, he's not going to impart that level of love to you. It'll be love, but it's not going to be on that level. It's a different kind of level altogether. It's like, I can love the women that are in this room, and you're all very beautiful women, and I can love you, okay, but I can't love you the same way that I love my wife. It's a different thing altogether. So there are different levels of love and we need to be able to understand that kind of stuff. All right, so let's move on. Uh, third point, giving up family. More, this is a hard one. Giving up family. Man, if you don't get this under control, I've watched people bring these idol, this idol right into their house and it sits there and it entrenches itself and it's got people in complete turmoil and control and domination in their life and they don't know what in the world they're going to do because they love their family. But the family is pulling them in the other direction and where Yahweh's trying to take you. So it's a problem. And to get this in its balance is extremely crucial. And if you don't get it into a specific kind of a balance, it becomes an idol in our life. And it becomes a stronghold. Any idol that we allow, it becomes a stronghold. And so let's read. So Yeshua said to them, Assuredly, Amen, Amen. In other words, let it be, let it be. I say in a systematic way to you, that in the regeneration, in the rebirth of the messianic restoration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of power of his glory, which is praise and worship, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones of power, judging with judicial law, which is the Torah, the twelve tribes who are offshoots of Israel. That's what he says. I mean... This eternal life is not just about living for eternity, but it's also about a governmental structure. You know, you could ask the question, what is the gospel? The gospel is a good news that Yahweh is coming with his kingdom. And his kingdom is going to be established on this earth, and there will be no more rebelling against 
about making idols, worshiping those idols, rejecting his name, defiling the Sabbath. There won't be any more of that. There will be law on this earth and it will go forth in Jerusalem as it says to the four corners of the earth and all humanity will bow their knee and they will do this however much they're fighting about it right now. And so we will be implementing this judicial law of the Torah to the nations. That's why he says some of you will be kings and some of you will be priests. And so I don't know what you're going to be and I don't know what I'm going to be um, but the bottom line is, to the degree that you understand Torah now, by not just studying it, but implementing it spiritually into your life and applying the concept by faith as the seed of Abraham and seeing how Yahweh manifests the blessings in your life through that application, then it goes, oh, I would have never understood that in my natural mind. But my spirit mind has now been transformed and now I get it. I understand it, and I can understand why people out in the world would never get this, because they're not the seed of Abraham. You've got to be the seed of Abraham if you're going to understand this kind of stuff, because that is the seed of faith, of which we are. Okay, so let's move on. Verse 29. And everyone who has left, yielded up houses, domestic families, or brothers or sisters, or father or mother, or wife or children, or lands for my name's um, that has authority and character's sake, that is the cause of this in the first place, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Now, clearly, I mean, there are religions that will take scripture like this, and, and, and well, Anthony's not here, but he'll tell you where he come from. The leader of that place tells him, you cannot have any connection to your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, and if I catch you even talking to them, I'm kicking your can out of this fellowship. Now that's an extreme. That's an extreme. That's not what this is talking about. This is not, I mean, look, if he really meant that you're not to have any connection to your family whatsoever, how are you going to be a light to him? Does not Yeshua say that we should not put our light under a basket? Well, if you ostracize your family and your friends and all that kind of stuff, how are you going to do that? Again, it comes back to balance. It comes back to being able to discern, do I feel a spirit, an idol in that other person trying to drag me away from where Yahweh's bringing me to? If you can feel that pull, that's a key that there's something wrong. And you got to put your feet down right there and you need to put that person in check in a proper perspective of your life. It still doesn't mean you necessarily cut them off, but it means that you must be in control. After all, you were given this kingdom authority. You either exercise it or you don't. I mean, that's your personal choice, but you also have to deal with the unintended consequences that come as a result. Okay, so uh, where was I? Let's see. That is the cause of this shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. See, here we go. Back to the eternal life. Then they also, let's see, point four, taking care of others. Now that seems to contradict what we just, what I just read. But you know, again, it's about understanding this in a balance. So we need to be able to take care of others. If you want eternal life inherent inside of you and staying inside of you, you must have a mindset where you take care of others. My wife and I have had that philosophy ever since I came into this fellowship. We give, we give, we probably are really bad about receiving, which is a problem that we need to deal with, or I need to deal with, because she's not so much. If somebody's giving her something, she'll take it. Me, I t I'm like, I want to give something back in return. But the thing is, is that um, we need to be able to take care of other people. And I'm not just saying in the fellowship, but also family members and friends, or somebody you meet on the street, okay? Um, if you feel led to do that. We need to have that giving kind of heart is where he's going to be going with this. So in verse 44 it says, Then they also will answer him saying, Master, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger who is a guest or a host or naked or sick, feeble and or, or impotent um, or in a prison and did not minister, wait upon as a deacon to you? When? They're asking. Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, Amen, Amen. I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So what this is saying is, 
this is where you're getting into trouble because you have a mindset that you don't you're not a giver you don't want to get you're a hoarder you want it for you but you don't want to share it with nobody else and that is not a mindset that we can have verse 46 and these who practice that concept will go away into everlasting punishment which is penile affliction but the righteousness into eternal life so here we go if we have the mindset that we share what we have with others you know um, and you maintain that giving heart you know blessed is it's more blessed what to give than it is to receive so the more you give the more you're sowing the more you're sowing the more of a harvest you're going to reap but what's frustrating is and I've seen it this is the problem with Christianity because they have this prosperity type gospel and I actually believe in the prosperity gospel but not in the way that they espouse it the thing is is that there are some people in this life who give money away they give goods away and all that and Yahweh just pours more physical blessings into their life and I'm going man I'm I'm sweating my butt off working every day trying to make a penny and I'm giving away stuff left and right and I'm not getting much in return you know and I'm thinking to myself this is kind of getting old real quick I said Yahweh I don't know what's wrong but I you know I'm not giving it away to get something back per se but this 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 joke over here man you just pouring stuff in his life left and right and he's a scumbag you know on top of that and you're blessing him left and right and I'm supposed to be your righteous and I'm giving away all this stuff and I'm not getting anything back what's wrong with this picture but you know what some of us some of us are not destined to necessarily receive an abundance of physical blessings in this life and because of the absence of that is the evidence of the spiritual blessings you're going to get in the kingdom to come the position you will have in the government of Yahweh and so we can't be so narrow-minded to think that because we're watching Pedro over here and the money's rolling in left and right sorry Gabriella I didn't know you didn't know about this but um, <laughs> But the money's rolling. She's got her attention now. See, all women love money. Women love money. When they hear money, they come running. But anyway, the thing is, is that if you're busy watching that person, he becomes an idol. Does he not? And you need to check that idol in at the door. You can't let him into your house. You need to check him into the door. And you just need to be content with whatever things that Yahweh has given you, realizing, you know what, if I'm not getting it now, it's a test and it's a test to see am I going to still do what is right am I still going to move forward am I still going to be a blessing to others even when it's not coming back because it might just be that my reward actually comes when I'm glorified and then I get to see all this stuff that he he gives to me at that time which is for eternity it doesn't pass away here because we got mold and we got a rust and we got moths that will consume it but because we're physical, we're so attached to what we see and we feel and we touch and we taste that it's like, you know, I'd like to have both of them. <laughs> you know, why are you holding back on me? I want them both. I want it now and I want it there. And I'll tell you why I want it now. I want it now because if I get it now, all the heathens are going to see how blessed I am and they're going to be drawn to that light. <laughs> you know? So we have, we have ways of rationalizing, don't we? But Yahweh said, ah, good, good, good talk, but you're not convincing me. <laughs> no, nah, I'm still sticking with my plan. Okay. So anyway, let, the fifth concept is believing in him. And this is what the epistles of John that we've been going through is about believing in him. Because in him is where this eternal life is. And in him, there are no idols. And so if you want to get rid of the idols, if you're going to go into him, you can't bring those idols with you. They've got to stay at the front door. So that whoever believes entrusts one's spiritual well-being in a state of rest in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 16, for Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten and solely born, solely born. Okay, Elijah, Enoch, they're not born up in heaven. It says here, he's the sole, he's the only one 
that has immortality. He's the only one that's gone into heaven. So this nonsense of these doctrines out there that we hear is, is, is a bunch of baloney. Don't buy into it. Here it tells you in the Greek, the word begotten means solely born. He's the only one that's been born and from the grave. That whoever believes and trusts one's spiritual well-being in him should not perish or be destroyed, but have everlasting life. So there you go. It's about believing in him. You see, it's interesting because there's two kinds of beliefs with Messiah, basically. You can believe on the Messiah, and you can believe in the Messiah. John, what, we're, what, what John is talking about is about believing in the Messiah. There are a lot of people who believe on the Messiah, but it's a different concept than believing in the Messiah. Because when you believe in the Messiah, you follow him and what he says. When you believe on the Messiah, you believe, yes, he came, he probably did all this stuff, but I have no intention of following the way that he teaches. We talked earlier, there are some Muslims who believe that the Messiah lived. They believe on him, but they don't believe in him. Big, big distinction in philosophy between those two concepts. Don't be fooled. Okay, sixth point. Sowing and reaping the word. Sowing and reaping the word helps keep eternal life abiding inside of you. Okay? And the reason being is that when you sow the word of Yahweh, you see manifestations of miracles which are the confirmation of the gospel. The confirmation of the gospel is signs, wonders, and miracles following what you speak or what you sow out of your mouth. It can be good or bad. Because if we're sowing things out of our mouth that are contrary to Yahweh's promises contained in his word that he has meant for you, and you're sowing the exact opposite, well, the devil's going to say, I'll take that one, and I'll take this one, and I'm going to bring it into the person's life to show them that their mouth is very powerful. Now you got curses running all through your life. So we got to be careful what we speak out of our mouth. i got to catch myself all the time because a lot of times I say stuff because my eyes are seeing something and I'm saying to myself what my eyes are seeing is a contradiction to why I know it's in my heart and i got to be careful what I'm saying because I'm prophesying the wrong thing into the circumstances. And it ticks me off. But that's how fast the, the flesh is. It's on autopilot. And that's why we got to be on guard every moment of every day to make sure that we're not confessing stuff out of our mouth that's going to that's going to nullify the promises that Yahweh has sent from his throne down to this earth and it gets intercepted along the way by the enemy. So sowing and reaping is an important concept in Mark chapter 4, I think it's verse 20 something. Yeshua sums up the whole thing about sowing and reaping and he says if you don't understand this concept of sowing and reaping, you will not understand anything that I have said in these gospel messages. Because it's all based on that concept. So sowing and reaping is a very important part because when you've got blessings flowing into your life, spiritual, physical, um, um, whatever the case may be, financial, health-wise, whatever, those things keeps eternal life abiding in you because it keeps your faith and your hope strong. Especially when it seems like all the circumstances around you are coming against you and trying to tear you down. Okay, verse 25. Do not say, do not say, there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Do you not say, I'm sorry. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they're already white for harvest. Now, he's talking about this in a kind of physical thing, but the bottom line is you can apply this in a spiritual manner because each and every one of you, Yahweh has already mandated a harvest in your life. Just, you may not have seen it yet. In other words, it may not have arrived on your doorstep yet, but Yahweh from the foundation of the world before you were even in your mother's room, womb has already established this harvest for you. But do we have the spiritual eyes to see it capture it and embrace it I think many of us don't many of us don't and some of it comes down to the fact that we we haven't seen it because it hasn't been revealed yet but you have to know that it's there it exists and I want to see it but we haven't even gotten to the point that point yet and if we say that we want to see it then Yahweh through a vision through a dream or through a word of knowledge from somebody else can say that to you and then you can see it. But we haven't even gotten to the point where we even want to see it. We're just thinking one day it's going to drop on my lap. 
Uh-uh. Not generally, no. This is about abiding in Yeshua. When you abide in Him and you believe on the promises, even though you haven't seen it yet, at some point, because you have the will and the desire to want to see that harvest, whatever it is, Yahweh at some point will show it to you. And that will excite you even more. So this eternal life stays in you through this kind of excitement, through sowing and reaping. Verse 36, And he who reaps receives wages, payment for services rendered. You sh deserve to get paid for services rendered. If you're working for the kingdom of Yahweh, if you're sowing the word of Yahweh, you deserve to be paid wages for that. Because you're a laborer. You're a bond slave. And you're about your father's business. And gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows by scattering seed, scattering seed, not all seed is going to germinate. Not all seed is going to produce a hundredfold. Some will produce 60, some 30, some 20. It's not for us to decide. It's just our job to sow the seed. Yahweh will give the increase when he feels the time is right. And he who reaps, it's amazing. Sandra's a good example. Sandra can go out and she could talk to some poor slob out on the street and that person is excited by what she's saying. I go out and talk to them, get away from me, leave me alone. You know, you know, so, you know, it's like, I'm like, there's something wrong with this, you know, you know, she has a much softer touch than I do, too. But, but there are some people, there are some people that just have this natural way to connect as kindred spirit to another person. And they have that kind of influence. And I admire that because that's a blessing from Yahweh when you can do that kind of a thing. OK, he who reads may rejoice together at the same time. So here you go again. This is Yom Teruah. When Yom Teruah takes place and we all become glorified beings, we will rejoice together in this harvest that we all get at the same time. Okay, seventh point. Eating his flesh and drinking his blood keeps eternal life within inside of you. Eating his flesh and drinking his blood keeps eternal life inside of you. Let's look in John chapter 6. And actually it should be verse 53 to 54, I think. Well, we'll see. Then Yahshua said to them, Most assuredly, Amen, Amen. Let it be done. I say to you, unless you eat the meat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, the juice of the grapes for the atoning, you have no life as a state of rest inside of you. None. In, and the word no means emphatic. In other words, there's no two ways about it. You can't mince it any other way. It means absolutely no. Emphatically, no. There's no ambiguousness about that word. It means no. Period. Capiche? That's what he's saying. That's what it means. No. Verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh, which is meat stripped from the skin... And drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. There's your Passover. There's your Passover. We read the scriptures in the book of John at that time about these concepts here. And so it's so important to be able to do that because that's how you abide in the covenant. You abide in the covenant, you abide in his eternal life. So eating his flesh and drinking his blood is one way to keep the idols in that area out of your life and checked out at the front door. And that's how you abide in eternal life in that particular area. Eighth point, knowing the Father Yahweh. This is a big one because this comes back to the third commandment. And so few people know this. It's amazing to me how simple this really is. It's the third commandment. And yet the world still doesn't even understand it. And then when you explain it to them, they want to kill you. Wow, that's, I think that's pretty cool that they want to kill you. Because that should be a confirmation that this is special spiritual information that is not imparted to just anybody. Because in John chapter 17, I won't read it, but Yeshua is praying to the Father towards the end. He's praying to the Father. He says, Abba, Father, these men whom you gave me out of the world, I have revealed your name, Yahweh, to them. Amen. Now, you can only reveal something to somebody if you assume they didn't know it. So clearly Yeshua knew they didn't know the name. He didn't say, I revealed it to all the other people. I just revealed it to the ones you gave me out of the world. 
Knowing the Father is very important. Very, very important. The, the intimacy part is about using his name. He wants his name used. He doesn't want these generic titles used to him. And in some cases, they're actually blasphemous. They come from pagan idols. And yet we still fling them around like it's nothing. Check the idols at the front door. Check them out the front door because uh, one of these days when I finished a video that I spoke up in Ocala, I went through this whole thing. And um, it's important because if you want to have the name of the Father written across your forehead, you can't be slinging these other names around. Now, maybe you don't mind going through the tribulation. Maybe you don't mind the persecution during that period of time. Maybe you don't mind having your head lopped off to prove your allegiance to Yahweh. Maybe you don't mind being one of the ones in heaven that's waving the palm branches. But the bride, she's up at the altar. I don't want to be out there in the crowd in heaven that's waving the branches. The ones that lost their heads. <laughs> I don't want to lose that. Okay? I want to be in the place of safety where I'm nourished for three and a half years for the final training of the Messiah Yeshua because the name of Father has been sealed and seared into my forehead. That's the group I want to be in. If you want to be in that group, we can lock arms. If you don't want to be in that group, keep saying God, keep saying Lord, keep saying Jesus, keep saying all these other names which are fictitious names that have nothing to do with whom we, the one we serve. Sooner or later, we got to get this thing down. And we got to get rid of those idols. We need to kick them out at the front door. Each one of us has a door to our heart, a gate entrance. And you either let it in or you don't let it in. You're either convicted or you're not convicted of any of these principles. But I'm just harping on this particular one. So let's read in verse 2. As you have given him authority, freedom with mastery and power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true Elohim and Yahshua HaMashiach, whom you have sent. We got to know the Father. It's just not about knowing the Son. We got to know the Father. The Son says, I came to restore that relationship back to the Father. Ninth point. In order to keep eternal life abiding within you, seeking patience, glory, and honor. Seek patience, which is a real hard one, is a real hard one. Because I think most of us suffer from one of the things that where we all stumble. I think, I think it's in Ephesians 5. I don't remember. It goes through and it talks about all the, the, the fruits of the Spirit. And one of them is um, uh, self-control. Self-control. If you read them in the order in which they're listed, self-control, bam, we all stop right there. We all get nailed right in that spot because we're so doggone impulsive and compulsive that we won't get our rear ends under control. And we won't use self-control in given situations. We just want to do what we want to do. We want to say what we want to say. And nobody's going to stop me. And then the next one that's supposed to come that you'll never get, and I don't get, is perseverance. Perseverance can't show up because we won't exercise self-control. It's the next logical step. So, patience is a very tough one because it requires self-control. Verse 5, but in accordance with your hardness, with callousness and stubbornness, and your impotent or means unrepentant heart where your thoughts and feelings reside, you are treasuring, amassing in reserves up for yourself wrath, which is violent passions with vengeance in the day of wrath, and revelation, which is the manifestation of the righteous judgment, which is a just sentence from Yahweh. And there are a lot of people who are heaping up this, their cells with this stuff. They're storing up a treasure. Every day they're walking in the flesh, walking in the flesh, walking in the flesh, and they're building a treasury. And they're going to lose their eternal salvation, their eternal life, if they don't turn that thing around. So for us, we need to be patient and not allow these things in our lives to frustrate us to the point where we don't go after the glory and the honor. But we stay patient. Verse 6, 
who will render to each one according to his deeds, which is works. Verse 7, eternal life to those who by patient continuance, by cheerful endurance, in doing good, seek for glory, which is honor and praise, honor, which is the highest degree of dignity. Do you ever stop to think, can, do I want the highest degree of dignity I can get? Are you striving for it? You should be. Because it's about having integrity. In other words, when your word is either yes, it's a yes. If it's a no, it's a no. Not in between. It's also about not being double-minded. Where one day you say, I'm going to do this, and then the next day you take it back. We can't be doing that. It's not a person of, of integrity. It's not dignity. The highest degree of a dignity and immortality of incorruptibility and genuineness. Genuineness. That's very important. Tenth point, in order to maintain eternal life inside of you. Good works and sharing. Good works and sharing. Command as a declaration those who are rich in this present age. That means Jose over there, he's got a lot of wealth. I'm going to come visit him later. He has no idea what I'm talking about. He will soon enough. <laughs> to be haughty arrogant, nor to trust as confide in uncertain riches. I couldn't really find what uncertain meant, but I can only surmise what it means is it's different kinds of riches that can come to you in different forms. It's not just money. It could be houses. It could be cars. It could be stocks and bonds. It could be jewelry, uh, precious metals. It could be all kinds of different things. But the point is they're uncertain because they could be taken away at any time also. You know, we've seen the housing bubble that we had. Out of a house that's worth a half a million dollars, by the time that's done, it's worth 150000 You know, so it's uncertain. You know, things can happen. Uh, as to confine uncertain riches in its fullness, but in the living Elohim who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So there you go. You do have the right to enjoy things that are given to you in this world. And some people say, oh no, I'm not supposed to have this, I'm not supposed to have that. That can be self-righteousness. Remember I talked a few weeks ago about the different levels of self-righteousness. There's this level here, and then there's a medium one, and then there's the higher one. And sometimes we confuse them because we use our own self-righteousness to establish itself as the standard when it should be Yahweh's form of righteousness. And we get them confused sometimes. Verse 18. Let them do good that they may be rich. So, by doing good, you become rich. By doing good, you become rich. Something to think about. Increased with goods. And that word means rich means to be increased with goods. So if he starts to pour physical blessings into your life, but you don't know how to handle them, then it's going to stagnate right there. And it actually might get taken away because you don't know how to handle it. There's an old saying I used to listen to a, a motivational speaker many, many years ago, and he mentioned something about the difference between a $10 pair of pants man and a hundred dollar pair of pants man and the guy who wears the ten dollar pair of pants has absolutely no idea what it feels like to put on a one hundred dollar pair of pants he has no reference for it and then if you try to put a hundred dollar pair of pants on him he'll destroy it in no time because he doesn't have any value for it. he didn't earn it he didn't understand what it took to get that hundred dollar pair of pants so same thing in the kingdom to whom much has been given much is required so you have to be a mindful steward for what Yahweh has given you and make sure you don't misuse it. Okay, in good works, as an occupation ready to give. Ready to give as being liberal with giving. Willing to share. Storing up as a treasure for themselves a good foundation as a substruction of a building. For the time to come that they may uh, lay hold of eternal life. So there they are. They're intrinsically linked together. Having a giving heart and giving and giving, giving. So you're laying up, you're laying up, you're laying up. You're storing up more eternal life for yourself when you do that. Okay, 11th point. Must not murder a believer. I, I would even say that's to any human being. But in this particular context, must not be a murderer of the brethren. 
It comes in different forms. So if you're a murderer where you run around destroying other people, then eternal life is not going to be abiding in you and you're in danger of the judgment. Whoever hates and detests to the point of persecution, his brother, is a murderer and you know that no murderer, here we go, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. It don't get any more clearer than that. Verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for other brethren. So you can't be a murderer and lay down your life for a person at the same time. It's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? You know, it's an oxymoron. You cannot murder somebody else. And you, so you've got to be able to implement this if you want eternal life abiding inside of you. Verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods, let me go back for a second. Okay. Whoever has this world's goods, which is a means of one's livelihood, and sees by discernment his brother in need, whether of lack of employment requirements or destitution, and shuts up his heart of inward affection, of pity or sympathy from him, how does the love of Yahweh abide in him? Now, i got to confess something. This happened to me the other day. And um, not now, but later it might be something interesting to talk about. But I, I went to Publix, and I went to the deli department. I was waiting in line to, to get something there. And as I was standing there, and the people were preparing uh, food for other people, this guy comes up, to, a black guy comes up to me. Um, I would say he's probably in his late 50s or so. And he started, he says, sir, he says, um, can you help me? And I turned around to look at him, and as soon as I looked at him, I thought to myself, all right. Well, this guy was dressed really strange, and he had super bright pink high-gloss lipstick on his lips, and his eyebrows were plucked like a female, and I'm looking at him, he obviously was, lives a perverted lifestyle, and, and he wanted me to buy him a whole big box of chicken, because he had no money. He was panhandling in the store. And I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking to myself, so Yahweh, what do I do? Because there's part of me that wanted to help him, but unfortunately, as you know, there's so many people that are con artists, and you don't know what you're getting out there anymore. It's not like it used to be years ago. And I felt like, no, I'm not going to give it to him. Because, first of all, the lifestyle you're leading, you know, I don't agree with that. But, but, but more than that, you're inside private property in a store and you're panhandling, disrespecting the people who own this store. And so I said, no, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And then he moved on and he started panhandling other people. But I was stuck with that situation. You know, maybe it was the right one, maybe it was the wrong. I, you know, I really don't, still don't know for sure. But my gut told me is, no, I'm not going to reward you for coming into private property and panhandling for people. You know, if it was outside, maybe we would have had a different discussion. And first, I would have probably tested you to see whether or not, you know, spiritually, I should be messing with you in the first place. But we're in the store, and I didn't want to disrespect the store, and I didn't want to cause a scene in there, so I just brushed him off. But, you know, the thing is, is that as a general rule, particularly with brothers and sisters in the Messiah, we don't have the right to turn somebody away. And so... There's been many times where I've had to give what I almost don't have to somebody else, but Yahweh always blesses us in return and replenish what I had to give away. The point here is, is that um, we can't be murdering one another. We've got to be careful with our mouths what we say. So let's move on. Whether a lack of employment requirements or destitution, okay. Um, and shuts up his heart of inward affection of pity and sympathy from him, how does the love of Yahweh abide in him? Okay, 12th point. In order to keep eternal life abiding with inside of yourself and kicking these idols out to the door, keeping yourself in the love. This has really been the gist of all the I've been going through in the epistles of 1 John so far as we're concluding this last part in, in um, 1 John. So, but you, beloved, building yourselves up upon, uh, upon your most holy in its proper state of faith, 
praying with supplication and worship in the Holy Spirit. Keep as to guard from loss or injury of yourselves in the love of Yahweh, looking for with patience and confidence the mercy of our master Yeshua HaMashiach unto eternal life. And on some have, now listen to this, I forgot this was here. And on some, on some have compassion. That means there are times when you're not to have compassion on somebody. That's what I'm getting out of it. On some have compassion in word or deed making a distinction so to withdraw from. Okay? So it's, it's, it's not just having compassion on some, but on the ones you don't, you actually are going to withdraw from because you're making a distinction between the one you should have compassion and the one you should not. But others save, deliver, or protect with fear of alarm and fright, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So in conclusion, what I hope I've been able to do is give you 12 basic concepts of how idols encroach into our lives and take over our lives, however subtle or blatant, depending on your ability to sense what's going on in your life, and how to kick them out to the door of your life, the gates of your house, and be able to then freely serve Yahweh in such a way through these 12 basic concepts that each one of them shows eternal life will abide in you if you do them. And if you don't do them, then eternal life begins to vacate. And the problem is, is that once it begins to vacate your life, it gets harder and harder and harder to do the righteous things. Because now you have a swap, you have a transference of spirits that's going on. And what's happened is the Ruach HaKodesh is leaving because it's being quenched. And the unclean spirits of these idols are coming in. This is what John was warning about. Stay away from these idols. If you want to abide in Yeshua and you want to abide in eternal life, stay away from, be on guard with these idols. Don't get into this kind of worship. The epitome of all this is Solomon himself. Yahweh was living in the Holy of Holies under uh, Solomon's reign. But because he brought in all these other concubines, they brought their foreign idols with them, did they not? Yep. And because of that, Yahweh says, Adios amigo! I'm out of here. I'm catching the last train. As uh, what that song uh, by Don McLean, Bye Bye Miss American Pie, they caught the last train for the coast. I'm out of here. And he left the temple. And Yahweh hadn't been in there since. So all this works that they were doing of the flesh, serving in the temple was for nothing because Yahweh wasn't there anymore. We have to be careful to make sure that we too don't bring in idols into our temples so that Yahweh doesn't vacate our temple as well and leave us destitute. So let's be a committee of one to do all that we can to examine ourselves before we're coming up to the Passover to see what we can do about kicking these idols out the front door so that we can be empowered to have the full life of Yeshua living inside of us so that on that day when he comes back, we have the name of Yahweh written on our foreheads. We get to go to the front of the line, so to speak. Amen.